I'm Jeff Fisher, an XR programmer at Epic for the last six years, uh, working on virtual reality and augmented reality during that time. And uh, we're going to talk about how to make <coughs> augmented reality applications for UE5. And first, we're going to talk about what you need for augmented reality. So augmented reality is virtual content in the context of the real world. And the context is the space you're in, the objects around you, the people around you, and where you are in the world, or at least some of these elements to, to be AR. So we're going to have features to support these things. And Unreal 5 ships with a number of templates to show you how to do some AR-related um, features. And we're going we're to go through those quickly to see what they have to offer. Um, the virtual reality template. So this is not an AR template, but it is a, a virtual content in a 3D space that you interact with. And it has a lot of features that are useful for AR, like motion controllers, the way you set up a camera in Unreal for virtual reality or augmented reality, um, the um, <coughs> grabbing objects and manipulating them using physics. It also has an in virtual scene uh, menu system attached to your arm, which is a good way to do UIs in virtual reality or in uh, HMD <coughs> platforms, or HMD AR platforms. Next, we have the handheld AR platform, or template. And this is an example of a tablet or phone-based AR, where you hold the device in front of you, and the virtual content is overlaid on top of the camera feed. And uh, so like Android or iOS devices. And this is a good example of how to do a UI for that form factor, where probably you just put the UI like a normal um, phone game onto the screen and, and tap it directly. It's also an example of uh, what we could call spawned AR content. So if you open up the level for the handheld AR template, you'll see that there is not very much in it. There's a couple of lights, and there's some documentation tips and nothing else. All of the virtual content is going to be spawned dynamically in response to user actions. In this case, uh, we collect a little additional context about the world, a, a rectangular plane in front of you, and then you um, place objects onto it by, by pointing the device and, and tapping. And this also illustrates another thing about AR interactions. Uh, Placing items into a 3D space is difficult, and you want to constrain it however you can. And in this app, we constrain it by using this plane to turn a 3D problem into a 2D problem. Now you're just pointing at a spot and dropping onto that spot, and that's way easier for people to do. Next, we have the HoloLens viewer template. So this is an HMD-based AR uh, project, and it's also a uh, example of another way to create AR content in Unreal, which is putting stuff in your level, which is kind of the more, the more typical workflow for Unreal. You have your level, you put content into it, and then people see that content. So we have this complicated mechanical device that's the centerpiece of the uh, experience, and when you start up the app, that device is in a spot, and then you adjust it to be in a convenient spot for you to work on it. And then this template also uh, will store that position so that on a later session, the content will automatically be in the spot that you chose previously. <clears throat> and then we have one more example, which is a showcase sample, the Mission AR project. And this doesn't run in Unreal 5. You probably have to back up to 427 to get it to run, but you can open it and look at how it was made in Unreal 5. And at, at first, this seems a lot like the HoloLens viewer template, right? There's some content. It was authored in levels. It's, you just need an open spot in front of you for it to live. Um, but the more interesting thing is the original version of this project, which was a stage presentation. So there were two presenters, and there was a camera filming those presenters as they looked at and one of them interacted with the virtual content to drive the demo forward. And then we overlaid the virtual content onto that camera feed. So we had three users experiencing the same AR virtual content in the same real world context. They were all seeing the same thing at the same time in the same spot. And there was a dedicated server uh, replicating 
the state so that they all saw it, so that they all saw the responses to the interaction from the one presenter. <clears throat> So this is an important thing to understand in AR, um, the real world space versus the virtual space. The real world space is the real world, right? Where all the objects are in the real world. And the virtual space is where all the virtual objects are inside of your instance of Unreal that's running. And these are both, these are both spatial mappings and they align in a particular way. And we need to, we need to understand that sometimes. So VR has this same distinction, but, um, <clears throat> but the real world in VR is very simple. You've got your HMD, and we need to know where it is in the real world so that we can render the right thing for, for the person to feel like they're in the virtual space. And their controllers are in the real world, and we need to know, you know where they are so, they can, so that when you move your arm, it interacts. And then we have a, a safe play area around you, perhaps, to keep you from falling out of a window or bumping into something. That's not much of a real world, though. And in, in AR, we have a lot more um, real world to worry about. So in Unreal, we talk about the real world space as the tracking space. That's the space that the device is using to describe the real world. When, you are, um, when the real world is telling us the location of an, or when the, when the platform is telling us the position of a tracked object, it's giving it to us in tracking space, and that's one-to-one -one lined up with the real world. Then we have the Unreal world space. And that's the space inside of Unreal. You know, if you open up a level, if you're building level-based content, that corresponds to the space inside of the level, where everything is in the level. And at runtime, it's where everything is in, at runtime in Unreal. And um, you can change the relationship between these two. We have if you look inside of any of the platform plugins, you'll see a uh, tracking to world transform. And that's the transform that takes a point in tracking space and turns it into a point in Unreal space. In Unreal, we do that with the, the player pawn. So the player pawn is at the tracking space origin. So the tracking to world transform is the same as the pawn's transform. If you, if you put 0, 0, 0 in tracking space into Unreal, it shows up at the position of your pawn. And your, your pawn's position is also that, that same transform from the Unreal World origin, right? And if you think about how motion works in a virtual reality uh, game, you, you can see how you move the pawn through the world and you see the world you know, moving by you, right? That works, that works for any game, not just a virtual reality game. You move the pawn through the virtual space and you see new virtual space as you go. But with VR or AR, you also have a real world position. And your pawn is in the same position in the real world all the time, barring maybe a little bit of room scale walking around. But you can't go a long ways. Um, so what we do is, we're, if you were a third party observer who could see both the real world and the virtual space, what you would see is the, the unreal world space moving past the user. The user is staying still, and the unreal world space is moving around them. And that's also how we can manipulate level-based content for AR. And I have a little example, uh, hoping to illustrate these things better than just talking about them. All right, so I've started up my test level, and we can see the content that's in it in front of me. Uh, I've got some controls to control the test level up above, and I've got some meshes down below, and a little coordinate system marker in the middle. That is the Unreal world origin, so zero, zero, zero in Unreal space. So if you opened up the editor for this level, this is pretty much what you would see. The meshes down below are set to be static, so they can't move, and they have some baked shadows on those um, white blocks. The controls are all movable and attached together so that we can position them where we want, and then we can move our potentially heavier weight content um, to where we want it to be. So this is all in Unreal space, right? And we can turn on, I've got a box here. I can show this big rectangle, you know, wire mesh rectangle I'm inside of. That's representing the Unreal space. So it's kind of oriented this way. Let me turn that back off. And if I, if I back up a little bit, we can see that there's a pin here called tracking origin. 
this is the tracking space origin. So more or less where my HoloLens was when I started up the level. And the pawn is, the pawn's, um, the pawn's origin, the, the camera component actually is parent's origin, is the tracking space origin. So in Unreal Space, my pawn is here, a couple meters in front of the content. And we can turn on a visualization of the tracking space. You can see it's a little bit closer to me, but it's oriented the same way. Let's turn off the tracking space box. So one thing we can do is we want we want to move these controls around to a more convenient place. So I've spawned an actor and I've attached the controls to it. And the actor, I, I call this a pin actor, and it's an actor that knows how to um, create an AR pin and thus the underlying, in this case, Windows Mixed Reality anchor to hold it in real world space. So there we go, I've, I've pinned it now, my pin called controls and I'm holding my controls there by the wall. What about the static content? So the static content can't move in Unreal Space. So what we need to do is move the whole world. And I want to get that content to be on top of this cabinet. So let's spawn another pin actor. This one's called Origin. And I'm going to place it down here on top of the cabinet and pin it. And then I'm going to move the Unreal World Origin to that actor. So I've got a little delay on this so we can see it happen. And it's popped over there. And we can turn on the Unreal box and we can see that that has also kind of rotated and it's moved this way a little bit although you can't really see that. So we've just moved the whole Unreal space to align with the real world in the way that we want it to and all of our content that was authored in Unreal space is now is now lined up with the real world the way we want it to. This stuff all stayed in the same place because it's pinned and the pin's job is to keep it in the same real world location so which is also the tracking space location. And we can illustrate this a little bit better by um, starting the world moving. So I'm now rotating the world around my pin. And what that really means, so let's back up a little bit here. Here's the tracking space origin, which is staying in the same place, right? Relative to the real world. I am teleporting my pawn around in a circle, around my Unreal Space origin. That's how, that's how we move the world, is by moving our pawn inside of it. And if you think about a VR game where your, your pawn is moving through it, in the real world you're staying in the same place, this is, the, this is the same thing, where our pawn is moving through the virtual space. And we could use this to move forward or whatever, in this case I'm just spinning. Well, let's uh, stop the real world from moving. What else is in tracking space? My hands, they're in the real world, right? So when I'm tracking my hands and I've got these little, these little movement or these little motion controller things attached to it, those are in tracking space. If we moved the unreal world, they would stay still in the real world, but they're moving through the unreal world even when I don't move my hands. And the same goes for my headset, right? It's in a real world location so that it stays it, its real-world location is important because my, my head moving is what controls its movements. So I mentioned uh, AR pin in that video, and all the, this this mapping of the real world to the virtual world is not the easiest thing in the world to deal with. So the platforms have a feature to help you with it, a platform anchor. So a platform anchor is a fixed point relative to the real world that the platform maintains. And it tries to keep it in the same spot, particularly relative to nearby geometry, right? So, so it can try to keep you on the top of a table or on a wall or just near something interesting. And we make sure that that, that also survives um, moving the unreal space relative to the tracking space. And then we wrap that in AR pin, which is an unreal class that just wraps the platform anchor and makes different platform anchors look the same to your application so you can make cross-platform applications more easily. With the AR pin, you pin a scene component in place. So you've got a scene component on an actor you and a transform that you want it to stay at and you create a pin and now that actor is going to stay uh, in that real world position. And it's going to stay 
an important point is that platform anchors aren't just about moving the unreal world, they're also just about maintaining a better fixed geometry versus the real world. These devices are scanning the world all the time, trying to figure out where they are and how they have moved. And they might change their mind a little bit about, you know, there's a wall over here and there's a wall over here, and they might decide after scanning more, well, this wall is actually a little bit closer than I thought. And if everything's fixed in the Unreal World space, your, your content would now be through the wall. But potentially, the platform could know that and adjust the tracking space position of the anchor, and your content would stay better aligned to the, to the real world. Um, this has some important consequences, like be careful not to assume that the relative positions of your anchors is always exactly the same, because they could change somehow. And uh, also, um, they have recommendations about how far, how close to an anchor you should stay before, before it might, you know, just a tiny rotation when you're on the end of a big lever is gonna start moving you a lot. So you wanna stay within, you know, two or three meters. The recommendations may vary a little bit by platform, but basically the, pl the closer you can stay to your, your pin, the better. Um, this could get complicated with really big objects. You might need to have multiple pins and then, you know, you, you, a spline or something like that might work really well to stick to multiple pins across an area in case they adjust. Um, so this is the blueprint for doing an AR pin creation. Uh, we have, this is, this is from my AR pin actor that I used in that, in that sample. So it's basically an actor that pins itself to its current position. So we're getting the actor transform down here at the bottom. We're getting the default scene route. We're calling pin component, which gives us a pin which we store in a variable so that we could do things with it later. And that's all you have to do. And then we'll talk a little bit about the math for moving the world origin, because this is one where the tracking to world con transform, you would actually have to use it to do, to do something like this. So I've got my unreal origin, I've got my AR pin, and I want to move my unreal origin to be on my AR pin in the real world, right? And I'm gonna do that by moving my pawn because that's how I change the, the relationship between the uh, unreal world and the real world. So these two blue objects, the AR pin and the pawn, they both have a real world position and they will maintain that. The, the pawn is you know, the reference for the whole tracking space and then the AR pin is fixed in tracking space because that's what it does. <laughs> so what we wanna do is, is um, Basically, those two things are gonna stay relative to each other in the same position if, if we move the unreal world. So we need to move the pawn, this, this little parallelogram diagram, we need to move the pawn until we've zeroed out the transform of the AR pin. You zero out a transform by, or, or turn it to an identity by combining it with its inverse. So if we take the pawn and we apply the inverse of the AR pin's transform, we will get to the position which will put the AR pawn at the unreal origin. And I've got the, the math for that at the bottom. And uh, this is what the blueprint looks like. Um, I have a player pawn and a target actor. I'm gonna get the uh, transform out of my player pawn, which is the tracking to world transform. There's also a special blueprint function you can call to get the tracking to world transform. I, I did it this way here, kind of for clarity, to reinforce the specialness of the pawn. Um, and then we have the AR pins transform, we invert that, we apply, we com combine those. And then we got a couple more steps that I go through here. Um, first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break the transform, I'm gonna break its rotation, and I'm gonna zero out roll and pitch. For this app, I don't want my, um, I don't want to roll or pitch the world. You could, but I don't want to. And this is probably redundant anyway because the pawn class I'm using enforces Z up, so it probably wouldn't actually accept the roll or the pitch. Um, but it could be important if you're, if you're doing something else, or it could be important to not do this if you actually want to be able to roll or pitch the world. And then the other thing is, happens, it's kind of done by the teleport function. Um, you can see that it doesn't take a transform, it takes a location and a rotation separately. You don't want to uh, have a transform matrix in a loop where it's the input and it's the output because you could accumulate error inside that transform and something weird could happen. You're pretty well protected from this here at, at multiple levels, so we don't have to do anything explicit about it. So 
another thing that we needed for Mission AR was uh, anchor persistence and sharing. We don't want to have to do that setup stage live in the show. We don't want to run it and hope that our app keeps running for an hour while we wait for the show to actually stop, start. We want to be able to rehearse and have that location be exactly the same every time. Um, and we have three users, and we need them all to have the same idea of where the content is. So let's talk about how, uh, how we did that. And we've got another video just, just showing me doing that in this test level. So we've set all this up. And we don't want to have to do this every time we come into our app. You know, maybe we've placed these things where we want them, and we want to be able to come and go and not have to do that setup again. So we have the ability to persist pins, and there's various ways of doing that. In this demo, we're using Azure Spatial Anchors, which persist them up to the cloud. And we can see we've got this ASA session status. So we started in Azure Spatial Anchors session when this level started up, and it says ready, create, recommended create, you know, both 16 and three. If those numbers are better than one, then you're ready to create pins. And we're obviously way over one, so we're totally fine. Um, so I can save my pins. I can save my control pin. I can save my origin pin. You see it says ASA saving. So that one succeeded. This one has now succeeded. So we've uploaded some, deep, some data about the geometry here, and I have allowed it to know about the Wi-Fi and the GPS location or GPS coordinates so that it can, it can find where it is. Um, let's create another just sort of arbitrary... Let's create another, I accidentally created a controls pin. We won't save that one. So let's create another pin, you know, some other kind of content we wanted to put over there. We'll save that one. So that one's saving. And then we can quit out of the application. And close it. And we will start it up again. And let, let's stand in a different spot so our tracking, our tracking position will be a tracking space will be aligned differently. So the content's over there instead of over there. And if I back up somewhere here, we'll see the, the tracking origin. Um, we haven't loaded our pins yet, right? This level is not set up to automatically start loading the pins. I have to trigger that. So we're going to start a watcher. And a watcher is their word for their API for finding pins around you. And here we go. We've loaded up the controls. And this level is set up to automatically snap the controls to that pin attached to it when it's, uh, when it's loaded. We've loaded the origin pin, and we've loaded this other pin, pin number four over here. Let's um, move. The, so it's not set up to move the world automatically. I'm going to do that as a manual step. So we've got the same little delay. And then there we go. My world is now lined up, and my content is all the same as it was before. And these pins can last a long time. You set an expiration time on them. Um, I had a couple of them in this room down here for over a year when I deleted them. And, you know, I moved furniture around and all that, and they were still working good. So uh, this is also cross-platform. I've got a, a video of it on the phone, and I'm going to turn that on, but I'm going to mute it and just talk over it. So this is on a Pixel 6 phone using AR Core and Azure Spatial Anchors to, it's, it's the same app. And uh, instead of just saying what I'm saying in the video again, I'm gonna say some things about making a cross-platform app. So the very first step of this was super easy. It was just enable AR Core and get set up to build Android. The, and then my app was running. But all the interactions that were implemented in my app were based on tracked hands or motion controllers, and I don't have them on a phone. So luckily, this was my test app, and it was made to be kind of lowest common denominator, denominator while implementing all these other features. So it's basically a look and poke. Like, all I do is look at one of those boxes, and it lights up, and then I do the pinch gesture. So all I needed to do was replace the pinch gesture, because I'm still looking at things with my phone. But a lot of the work in going between um, form factors between HMD and tablet is going to be in the interactions. They're going to have to be very different. Another difference, which you can probably see in this video somewhere, there we go. Um, that cylinder is wireframe in the HoloLens, but the renderer here is not supporting wireframe, so it's just solid white. 
and I couldn't do that thing where I, where I showed the unreal space by drawing a wireframe box around me because it would just be a white box. Um, so, of course, you'll have small differences in the way rendering works on the different platforms. And then, potentially, performance is the other big stumbling factor. Now, these are both mobile-type devices with, with this app. I'm not, um, I'm not streaming to the HoloLens. I'm running on the HoloLens. So I didn't really have that problem. They were kind of roughly comparable, and it's a simple level, so it, it doesn't have a lot of that anyway. But uh, if you were trying to go between a you know, PC-based AR with a lot more power, you could easily have trouble porting it to a handheld. But I think something that's really cool about this is that, is that you can potentially have, you know, maybe for a marketing purpose or something like that, you could have a more expensive device that's harder to set up for the main viewer, and then you could have a secondary person who can also see the content and control it, but is using a much, you know, cheaper device that doesn't, that doesn't separate from the world as much. Uh, so, we need to add some things to our diagram. We've got our, our AR pin, pinning our scene component, is backed by a platform anchor. And now we have a persisting anchor and we have the stored anchor data in the platform, in the platform's system. So the persisting anchor is, is either just an ID, which, which we would typically store in a string, or it's a, an object that wraps the ID and lets you call functions on the object. Uh, and what, what you would do is you would have your AR pin and you would say, you would call a function to um, persist it, and you would get a persisting anchor or an ID. And then you could store that in a save game file, or if your anchor persisting system supports sharing to other devices, you could transmit it over the network to another device. And on the other end, you've got your ID, or your persisting anchor object, and you, um, you, you call a function, and it gives you back an AR pin wrapping a platform anchor for that spot. And now you have a real world position on a different device or at a different time that's, that's the same as before. Before this kind of stuff was possible, you, you had some, some options that were uh, bad and some options that were really bad. And the, the, the bad ones were kind of like putting QR codes everywhere. And that works, but it's ugly and it means you have to set up in advance. And actually, that, that can be a really good solution if you completely control the environment and don't care that there's a QR code stuck in the middle of it. Um, the worst solutions are where you try to get the tracking space origin to be the same by you know, putting your device in the same spot and turning it on and hoping that it chooses the exact same orientation and position. That'll probably get you close enough for a lot of purposes, but it won't get you really close and it is a really huge hassle. Uh, so these kind of systems are a lot better. And Azure Spatial Anchors is not the only one. Um, Google Cloud Anchors uh, can do the same sharing through time and across devices, and there are other ways to do it too. Uh, and I think it's important to, if you're planning to do an app and you, and you wanna do, uh, and you're gonna use anchors like this, it's important to investigate all these different systems and see which one does the things that you need it to do. One thing that Azure Spatial Anchors gave me for this demo is the ability to add a little bit of metadata to my stored anchors. So that's how I know that when I load up this anchor, it's the origin and this other one is the controls. It's because I stored just the word controls and the word origin on those pins. I didn't have to do any networking or any save game files for this demo. I don't think that you can make all that many um, interesting apps using only that metadata. You probably need some kind of networking connection to do more interesting stuff, but you can do things just like that. And definitely you could use that to save, to do a local only app where you're, where you're gonna save data to your own file. Um, because say you went to another room and you had that type of pin stored in that other location, now you can find it, uh, you, you find those pins just by scanning that room, right, through the system. You don't have to know that you're in a different room somehow and then look into your save data and find the anchors for that room. That, that starts to get a little bit a little bit chicken egg there. Uh, so here is just kind of the wrap-up demo where I'm, where I'm putting it all together to sort of everything that you need for, uh, to do something like Mission Air. Okay, let's put it all together now. Starting my app up on my HoloLens, starting up the watcher, moving the world origin, 
and then we can bring in a second device. So we'll need to start the watcher on the phone. It's loaded the pins. We'll move the controls, or move the world origin. So now, got it. look, it's showing the same thing. We've got the controls over here attached to that pin. We've moved the world origin so that it's on top of the cabinet. We've got our other random pins up there. What we've got now is on both devices, the Unreal World space is aligned to the real world in the same way. And at this point, we could use normal Unreal networking functionality to move things through the world, to spawn them, to replicate their positions, to replicate their state. And they would show up in the same place relative to the real world on both devices. And we have a, a very rudimentary version of that we can do right here, which is I can place another pin. Let's put it on the corner of the chair down there. So I've placed a pin on the corner of the chair on my HoloLens. It's not on the phone. You can see that. And then we can save it. So it's saving. And then we can watch it get loaded on the phone automatically here. And there we go. It's loaded that pin, pin number one, on the uh, edge of the chair. So we've got a space aligned. We can continue to add new real-world reference points and share them between the two devices. I also want to go over the plugins that are relevant for uh, the different AR platforms that we're supporting right now. Um, for HoloLens, HoloLens is an OpenXR-based platform, which is good. It means there's a lot of consistency in its behavior versus other OpenXR HMDs, uh, including the, the Meta Oculus HMDs that, that have some AR features. And there's also an eye tracker, a hand tracker, and then this hand interaction, which makes your tracked hands uh, act as a controller, which just makes it easier to do a, a cross-platform, a, a fairly simple cross-platform application with the HoloLens. And then there's the Microsoft OpenXR plugin. Uh, this is their plugin, which they maintain and provide through the Marketplace and GitHub that gives you access to all of their platform features uh, for HoloLens. And then, and then I have this Azure Spatial Anchors plugin. That's the, that's the plugin that gives you kind of the editor side of Azure Spatial Anchors. And then you need support for each platform for that also. And uh, in this case, Microsoft OpenXR provides that support. Then we have the AR Core plugins, Google AR Core. Uh, Google AR Core services, which I wasn't using here, but that includes the Google Cloud Anchors. And then AR Utilities includes um, some helpers for working with handheld AR. And, and then I have the two Azure Spatial Anchors uh, plugins in this case. And for AR Kit, we've got the AR Kit plugin. There's a face tracking one. Um, again, Azure Spatial Anchors supports this. This is a handheld platform, so we have that, those handheld helper, helpers with AR Utilities. And then um, the Google Cloud Anchors also work on AR kit, so that's another option there. And then Oculus. So I don't know a huge amount about the Oculus plugins. They're maintaining them. They have uh, a plugin and their somewhat modified ver branch of Unreal, Unreal that they support. So I would refer you to their documentation. Uh, this is an OpenXR-based implementation, though. <coughs> so uh, what about the future? So augmented reality is, is kind of in a similar place to VR a few years ago, where there's a lot of feature overlap and not a lot of API overlap. So you get kind of a different API for every platform. Um, will OpenXR help with that? So Microsoft and Meta are both working with OpenXR-based um, platforms, but right now they each have their own extensions for doing AR things. So, Right now, there isn't a lot, of, a lot of overlap there, although it does mean that the, um, the sort of, whatever, uh, maintenance level of, of activating features is similar between the two, which, which does help. And they're both fitting into OpenXR as their display system. Uh, so 
so right now it's still up to us to wrap these things and try to make them look the same so that it's easier to develop cross-platform uh, features. But if you wanna make cross-platform features, you should definitely look into that and see where you need to put layers inside of your app so that you could switch to using different systems on different platforms uh, because you might be able to save yourself a lot of work in the future for only a little bit of work at the beginning. 